Housing Municipalities uh, Convention. Um, thank you very much for giving us an opportunity to come out and speak with you. I know there's a number of questions. And so uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to come out and meet with you and talk about some of some of uh, your questions. So I my role is uh, I oversee business strategy and innovation for the Alberta RCP. So I'm in headquarters and I uh, read it and I'll let her introduce herself and her name. They both work in one of the branches that reports up through me. Uh, in our operation strategy branch, Rita looks after the financial aspects, uh, and Nermeen and her team are research and looked after the workload sort of perspective of this. So um, it's nice to be here. Thank you so much. I'll turn it over maybe to Rita. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Rita Brackison. I am the business strategies manager with the operation strategy branch here in Edmonton. Uh, my role is all about the financial planning, the forecasting, the invoicing, um, clarity around all of the financial pieces that are coming your way, um, and hope to answer, I'm sure, a lot of questions today. So thank you for having us. Then Normeen, did you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Normeen Hassam clark and I'm the Business Intelligence Manager within Operations Strategy Branch. And so my team and I uh, look after research and analysis, um, particularly as pertains to this report, it's the workload analysis um, determining uh, what the crime stats and uh, workload indicators such as crime severity index are indicating for um, resource needs and um, just providing some analysis and trends around those crime stats and, and resourcing needs for detachments across the province. Thank you. Thank you, Nermi. So just wanna thank you all for having us here. Um, this really allows us to, we, we put out a report, a 30 page report, um, and I'm, I'm new to this role. So therefore a lot of that information in the report is not something that I can answer. Um, so, I just, I really appreciate the time to to come here and answer some questions and answers and provide a bit of a background in regards to policing and, and what the your RCMP provide to your community. Um, so I, I guess in, in essentially the report is about uh, reducing the amount of members and therefore reducing the cost to, to the town of Hinton. Um, so, we talk a little bit, I can do the frontline policing um, side of things and what the, the current staffing is like at the detachment. Um, we do have 19 positions allotted for Hinton. Um, we are currently staffed at 17 positions. Um, the reason why it's 17 and not 19 is because there's times where um, leaves will, will take over some of those vacancies as well as um, transfers in and out, injuries, uh, and those type of vacancies. So that is why we're currently at 17 of 19 uh, vacancies. Um, so we do uh, provide a level of policing that is, I am, I'm new to, uh, from Grand Prairie, so the level of policing here in Hinton is not the same type of policing that what that I was used to in Grand Prairie. Um, there's a very huge component of community engagement in policing in region. So obviously our uh, frontline policing is our priority and it all will always be whether um, you guys, uh, your decision as a committee is to reduce uh, members, our frontline policing will always be um, our priority. Uh, but the part that will change would be the community engagement and um, I spent eight months in your community before I became uh, the detachment commander and community engagement is, is a very, very big part of what citizens want. And because I was a citizen basically for eight months of the year, um, I saw the police out, whether it's um, traffic stops, whether it's community events, the parades. Um, and so I would just wanna speak a little bit about that. So Hinton Detachment is a, Detachment where work-life balance is a very important part. And I stress that because it is an attraction to senior members to come from to Hinton. 
um, that is not a normal, uh, a normal thing that I've seen in Grand Prairie as a detachment commander. We've received recruits. Um, currently, right now, we have six members who are, this is their second detachment, and we have members with 10 years of service on the front lines. Um, this is, that is not a normal thing that we would normally see in Grand Prairie. Um, so the attraction to Hinton is the work-life balance, as well as the schedule. The schedule is a very important part that people search out, I guess, before they transfer to a detachment, um, as well as safe place for families uh, to raise their children. Uh, as police officers, we are well aware of the types of crimes that are in our communities, and each one of us believes it is very safe to raise our children here in Hinton. Um, as well, it gives uh, members time to investigate files. Um, they're not going from call to call to call, but therefore they have time to investigate. They have time to do traffic enforcement, um, other types of policing that we would not see as much in other detachments because they don't have the time. As well as they have times to uh, promote to our GI section. That is a, a very big attraction here in Hinton. Um, and opportunities for training. Um, What's GI? So GI is our general investigation GI. section. Um, we have a three-man general investigation session. Um, they they work on major and files that the frontline members don't have time. Okay. So a lot of it is drug work, uh, the warrants. They recently worked on person's files for the last two months. Um, that's not something that frontline members are able to do. Um, they do a lot of property crimes and in the sense they're able to do the surveillance, they're able to do um, the type of work that the frontline members do not have time to do. So they also bring with them experience because uh, GIS is a very sought after section. So they bring experience from other detachments in and therefore as well as training, they bring their training with them. As soon as we get experienced members, we no longer have to pay for the training. They may want extra training, but we already have a solid base of training if they're coming to us. Um, as well as GIS is a proactive unit. So they are taking the files, they're reviewing the files, and then they're making a game plan to perhaps it's, um, it's a theft ring and they can spend the time to investigate that sort of thing. Um, so they have the ability to basically move an investigation further rather than the frontline members who don't have the time. Uh, so they, I've been, I have on here that it's, it's a contact with the public and it's an ongoing um, contact with the public, <clears throat> and, which also helps with our, our community engagement. So frontline policing, like I said, will always be our, um, our priority. So therefore, if any reduction was done uh, on the RCMP side of things, we would see the cutbacks mostly in uh, being able to balance uh, the community engagement part of things. Um, so the many members here find uh, Hinton to be their home, not not just their detachment, but where they're posted. This is our home. Um, so therefore, you'll see them at, at uh, community uh, the parades. And they'll be on their off time. It's not during the time when they're supposed to be scheduled for work. They're they're attending these events on their off time in Red Surge, uh, recently with the Snowflake Parade down at the Timberwolves game, and that's all volunteer time. Uh, that shows the commitment to the detachment and to the community as a whole. Because if you end up with members who are burnt out, with members they disengage. They don't want to be part of the community. They just want to do their work and they want to move on. Um, so that's that's a part that I've really observed from being here in Hinton for only two months that members are very, very engaged with the community. Um, Murphy, Staff Sergeant Murphy has been here much longer than I have, and he has seen the, the benefits of having the GI section, having the amount of members that we do have. Um, Everybody in here knows I can talk for hours, <laughs> and I won't, because to be quite frank, honestly, I want to answer or make sure that we have ample time to address any questions, concerns, but anything with any historical context, I definitely can assist uh, with that, and what I've seen, I was a 
commander and hinted from 2017 to 2021. So I have very good contacts in those years. But I also speak to the previous commander, uh, Staff Sergeant Mark Fitzgerald, who had been the commander for quite some time previous to uh, myself transferring into Hinton. So I do have about a decade uh, that I can I can pull in and speak to some historical context as well. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it here maybe and and, uh, and maybe start answering some questions and see where that takes us. Council? Councilor Reyes. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. So how are we doing with 17 members? Okay, so frontline policing, how are we doing with 17 members? Um, so I, I, I mentioned before that we are experiencing some vacancies um, and I have not been here when there has been at 19 capacity. Um, so we are, we are managing at this point. Um, any extra members from the 17 to the 19, um, we are able to, to further our proactive police work on the front lines. We're able to further engage with the community. Um, I think uh, headquarters, you could probably explain a little bit more about how our proactive um, and I guess workload with the members? Sure, sure. If you'd like us to give you a bit of an overview about the workload, and I wonder, um, Narmeen, if you want to just maybe give a bit of a description of, about that uh, and the workload analysis that you provided in the in the report, and then <laughs> if you'd like, maybe Rita can um, pick up from there around the yeah. If that, Absolutely. If that works Absolutely. So um, I know that everyone had received the report ahead of time. So let me know if there's any questions about the methodology, but I'll skip the methodology in the meantime. Um, and just let you know that our workload is calculated um, just at a very high level overview of the methodology and not going into all the details, but um, the workload and proactive availability um, are both metrics that are calculated using five years worth of data. And that data includes um, calls for service as well as um, d data about travel time and response times um, en route to calls, um, as well as um, all of the information that's in the police reporting occurrence system. So our data management system. And um, in terms of Currently, with the 17 police officers, I can advise that Hinton is um, providing a level of service that um, ensures that police officers um, are able to appropriately balance their time between responding to calls for service, as well as having um, available time to engage in proactive activities. And so the proactive um, activities are such things as enhancing um, police service delivery in the community, community engagement, visibility, crime prevention activities, um, and one of the other components that ensuring that police officers have a good balance of time spent reacting to calls for service and actively engaging in proactive activities. Um, is that it does reduce the incident of operational stress injuries that are a result of burnout. Um, and so Hinton at the 17 um, members uh, currently out of the 19 would be sitting at around um, 700 um, workload hours per, per general duty police officer, which is a good range. Um, and around 56% of proactive availability. And just to put that into perspective, um, at the municipal level, municipalities um, set their level of service expectations for service delivery um, in consultation with the detachment, understanding the community's local policing priorities, um, and then conversations with um, the RCMP, so um, folks like um, my colleague Rita, who um, manages the financial pieces and provides guidance on the financial reporting and, and um, those sorts of things. Um, 
On the PPSA side, on the provincial side, we do have um, some some guidelines around what levels of um, workload and proactive availability we want to look at. Um, and so at the provincial level, the workload per police officer at the general duty level is around 1,100 hours of workload. And we aim for 35% proactive availability. Um, and falling below that 35% um, level causes for a very reactive police service where um, police officers are essentially going from call to call to call without very much time available um, to engage in those enhanced service delivery activities in the proactive um, crime reduction activities, the engagement with the community, visibility, all of those sorts of things. Um, so I'll leave it at that and see if there are any questions and also uh, give Rita a chance to weigh in with maybe some of the financial pieces related to the 17 members. Oh, sorry, Taylor. Um, uh, where was that question? Um, say for example, on page uh, 19, we, uh, I'm not saying we pick this option, but if we reduce the uh, constables by one, it shows that there's a $163,000 savings that looks like the first year and a $327,000 savings the second year. And that's for one position while we only pay $155,000 a year for that position. So can you explain those savings? Yeah, I can, I can address that. Um, and it, maybe if I, I can just give a quick high level financial piece, which will help you get into that. Sure. That's okay. So, so as a municipal uh, partner, 150,000 population, um, you would know that you're, uh, you're sharing costs in a sense of the, all the other municipalities after that 50,000. So it's been getting from individual uh, costs. So as a part of that, you're going to, you're going to, see a little bit less control potentially on some of those direct costs that go into the budget um, that feed into that per capita, but you're also going to see uh, a reduction in the ebbs and flows of what you're seeing for those expenditures. Um, because there are a number of communities uh, that factor in any other changes from each of those other communities is going to impact uh, the other partners with, within this bucket, right? So um, a, a simple maybe to help answer that, some of that, um, a quick reduction of FTEs might actually lead to an increase in that cost per FTE because it may not result in some other additional direct savings, such as a vehicle. Reducing by one get one person might not result in a reduction in vehicles. So we're still paying the same cost for some things, but it's allocated out between less FTEs, right? Um, there's a number, another, a number of other factors that can play into that forecast, which will impact these rates, but uh, that's that's one component there. I just want to, does everybody understand sort of the contract and it's like the contract that you're part of and it like that you're like the five to 15 and the difference between that and the municipal agreement over 90 percent so that always making sense I just wanted to make sure that there was and you do pay so what do they pay for um for Hinton <laughs> directly and then what is sort of part of the pool it might be yeah. So, so part of the whole divisionally pooled, there's the majority of costs are actually divisionally pooled for, for your detachment. So the direct salaries uh, for all the members, the indirect salary or indirect benefit costs that, that are associated with that, such as your pension, CBP, EI, um, all of your operating operating costs. So general O and to run the detachment, uh, guardian costs, all of your equipment. So your computers and computer life cycling, these vehicles. Um, the, the operational weapons, uh, the new pistols, tasers, things like that are all part of that divisionally cool uh, cost bucket. The one probably the key piece is is the overtime that is a direct cost to your detachment that will not be, it's your cost to bear, not any other detachment, and that will vary based on what you have there. Um, yeah, so the, those costs are pooled together and just kind of speak on the forecasting piece. That's We developed that plan at the start of every fiscal year. We developed a, a five-year financial plan, which you may have seen, um, you know, which, which is gathering all that information from the program areas on, you know, what equipment are we like, like mean, what things are going to change, what's happening in training, are there any new training requirements for it, where things are maybe coming off or, or changing. Um, and equipment is obviously, it's a significant uh, component of some of the increases that you're seeing. Um, pay raise obviously is another significant component that, component that you have seen and may continue to see. Um, so all of those costs are, are allocated or uh, summed up 
to determine what is your proportion of that based on that FTP. So um, as was mentioned, there's 19 positions here at the detachment. The forecast is built on that 17 uh, working FTE figure and uh, invoicing is basically developed from there and adjusted as the year goes out based on, on what actually happens. Um, does that kind of help answer? Mm -hmm. that, not quite. No, it's, well, it, see, the, see the, the, I know that we pay 155, which is 70%. 70 we all know that. Yeah. And yet the year two number is 327. Mm -hmm. So is the difference related to those fixed costs that you're talking about? It, it is going to be related to, because there's a number of different items within there. Um, you know, if, if some other detachments are reducing those expenditures, they're, you know, that cost per FTE is it, going to increase there as well. I don't have a detailed list of what every single line item here is. We can provide that for you. But it, it's it's based on that calculation of, of the adjustments with FTE. So a lot of it's... A lot of it might be the fixed costs, mm -hmm. and the, and then and then the reason why we see the um, savings so soon the first year, because we've kind of been led to believe that we wouldn't see the savings till after you know year two or something yet. In this these reports, we see savings immediately the first year. Is that related to the fact that uh, you have a turnover? Uh, you know, four to five officers out of the twenty two in any given year would be turning over, so the savings could be seen relatively quick. Is that? There's, I, I think part of that maybe as well that with the current uh, FTE burn rate that's there, um, it, it's actually a little bit lower than what that plan was developed based upon. So I think you might be trending a little bit. The truck, the plan was built on seventeen, so you're trending a little bit below that, even potentially closer to sixteen. So you will see a reduction in your invoice for this part this year. Um, some of the other components, so I'll speak to the equipment a little bit, is there's a large number of items occurring or, or being planned for, as you've seen, uh, the pistol is, is one of such item that uh, discussion has been that the contract will be awarded for that pistol this December. Um, we just recently learned that that, that is being delayed till April, right? So that's going to have an impact on what that deployment rollout looks, looks like throughout all detachments. Um, and when does that cost actually materialize within your expenditures? So there's a number of different um, balls in the air per se of expenditures and activity um, moving around. We develop that plan and forecast, and then it's always adjusted as as things materialize or don't materialize in some cases, and then you're only built accordingly to to what happens there. Thank you, and Councillor Taylor. Mm -hmm. Mayor Michaels, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for uh, doing this today. I think this is obviously va uh, extremely valuable conversation. Uh, I love the report, lots of options, and I know we're inevitably going to be talking about the options specifically, but there was, my question is, is, is there hybrid options between all the options you provided um, for us to potentially consider? And one specifically, uh, let's say it's option one where you want to remove one. Is it is it beneficial for or possible for the town of Hinton to uh, keep a constable and and perhaps not have a uh, a corporal? Uh, or that option is not there because logistically it's it's not a good balance. Um, uh, can we even consider outside of these eight options? And specifically, uh, is it better to, to to lose a constable or a corporal or or Hinton based on your uh, experience here? So I, I'm going to actually direct that because I know there's there's an easy way to explain um, that members have a different weight than supervisors. So, so, so one of the things that when it comes to between a constable or a corporal, we have rank allocation tables. So it's said, how many, I can't remember the number, but a certain amount of constables means that you have to have a corporal to oversee and in you know um i'll turn it to the team to talk about the duties and the reason why you need that oversight because of the specific you know file reviews etc cetera, etc cetera. uh I, I wonder if you want to yeah. speak to that so uh, there is a uh, rank structure obviously uh provide that supervision and oversight that we need to have out there um there's a number of factors that come into play in around that structure um uh, it's not just strictly numbers. We don't just have you know, four constable means we have to have a corporal. There are numbers that uh, we do go by, but that's a guideline that we use, and it depends on the, the structure that we have to have. So, for example, um, 
the service delivery model that's here in uh, Hinton is 24 hour coverage. That means we are running uh, a number of watch systems. Um, those watches need to have someone in charge of that watch. So taking away a corporal may be taking away one of those watch supervisors, okay? Or taking away, uh, you know, I don't know, the GI unit, there's a corporal in, in the GI unit. That's provide that oversight and guidance and experience in that GI unit. You take away that corporal, you're losing that experience and supervision. So maybe they're not supervising as many individuals in that unit, but they are providing that oversight and guidance that it, that is needed in that unit, okay? And so we have to take those into consideration as well. So it, it, uh, and from a cost saving perspective, there's really not a significant difference when you look at uh, you know taking away a constable out of the mix versus a corporal out of the mix. It actually doesn't come up when in the cost savings. You're paying the same when it comes to your overall cost uh, model, correct? Yeah, your, your salary ranges are going to vary depending on the years of service the person is in that position, depending on what rank they are. Like there's a bit of a jump from obviously constable to corporal, but there's a number of factors that impact that too, like the first two, three years, five years, whatever. It's, it's minimal. Yeah. I would like to just make sure we're all clear one thing here. So, uh, one thing that came up and I've been reading the report and looking at things, I'm not exactly sure what your target numbers are for the, for the town of Vietnam. Uh, 19 positions is what's your strength. Years past, you were looking at trending at a target of 18 people in those positions. But this last year, the target was 17. So there's already been a reduction of some sort. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's just agreed upon already and, or if it's just something that was carried over because of where we were at with where the positions were filled because that's kind of where things are at. But I just want to make sure we're clear on when we're talking about giving up a position where number we're talking from. Great, thank you. You good? Yeah. A, a, a follow up then from, from, from my perspective on that is, is I don't think we have set any targets and it's been a result of where you've ended up in filling uh, uh, member assignments. And that's what I wanted to clarify because I think that's important to, to really know where we're looking at from those numbers and what where the starting point is, so to speak. I think this is the first significant discussion we've had in this regard. Uh, Councillor Haas. Well, thank, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for mentioning that because, yeah, we haven't had a conversation like that. Um, so uh, this is information gathering to know what we have now. You know, so my question uh, is based on, uh, Nareem, you, you mentioned uh, operational stress injuries. So it's kind of a twofold question, but it depends on the answer on the first one. So if one of the members go on an operational stress injury, or, uh, who, who is then paying for that leave? Uh, is it down to Hinton or how does that work? Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so so anytime uh, when you're going to just, there's the rules around the number of days where they move to that kind of working category versus the special leave category. So when when a member does move to that special leave category, that becomes part of your indirect costs. So you're you're never going to be paying that direct salary for that member if they're not working at full capacity. Um, but it will form part of that division administration rate. And I can explain that in three quickly. So division administration, you'll see that rate is aligned on, on your invoice and your financial statements. Um, the, the simplest way to explain that is uh, it covers some of that administrative overhead costs. So you're not preparing that burden um, as a community as, as a whole for those resources. So uh, part of the administration is the core administration resources and our, and our costs. So, you know, the overhead for the staffing units, for training units, uh, for the strategy branch, they set us that form part of that core administration cost. Uh, you have the cost of special leaves. So any of those members from, from all of Alberta uh, contribute to that did admin rate and, and it forms part of that rate per, uh, per capita. And then the third key piece is the health benefit cost. So um, any of the members can take care of themselves and, and you know get back to work and whatever that is, and it's part of that health benefit cost. So that forms that rate. And so that's where you would pay for those members indirect you know, on special leave. Okay. So if I may, Mr. Chair, then go ahead. Thank you for that. So, uh, so what I heard also then said is based on what we currently have staff wise, that our operational stress injuries are uh, what I understood to be lower uh, than say other detachments that may have less members potentially. Is that what I is? That, did I hear that correctly from Noreen? Noreen. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a fair um, statement to make that, um, again, that operational stress injury 
um, will increase or the likelihood of it may increase as um, the level of reactive policing increases. So having having the number of resources that Hinton has um, currently allows for a good balance between that reactive policing and allowing um, the proactive policing, um, allowing some of those more positive um, components of community policing and community engagement and, and those sorts of things that reduces um, the incidence of operational stress injuries. If I can just follow up on that and then I'll leave okay. you guys. But where I'm going with this is, is you know, if there was a, a desire to reduce it, we could be looking at a community having more of these operational stress injuries, potentially reducing the number of members that we have then on the front line, which then also adds the cost to that, right? And so at least this way, what I'm hearing you say is that having the current structure that we have is reducing that, which then puts those members still out on the field doing the job that we expect them to do, which in a way is, you know, yes, we're getting more more bang for a buck, in other words, so, you know, so I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to minimize that operational stress management or the injuries is, 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 um, uh, it's a real thing, but if we can, you know, provide our members that, that, uh, uh, that, support uh with other members then we won't see that as much in the possible period. so thank you thank you mr chair staff sergeant Murphy. yeah thank you and I, just with respect to the positions and i i can comment again for several years past so uh when i arrived in 2017 it was the same the 19 positions uh were at the town of uh, Hinton Municipal Sign of the RCP Detachment. Uh, in reading this report, it looks like that uh, hadn't changed or that the last time we increased numbers was 2009 was when the official people were went in. I'm not sure when those actually were created, but uh, we're, we're talking a considerable time prior to that. So it's always been that 19. I can tell you it fluctuates from year to year, and it's great we're having this conversation. We've got a lot of uh, knowledge in this room that uh, Shiloh arranged to, to bring with her today. Um, but it's very important to, I, I think, to recognize as, as I went through those years as a detachment commander here, uh, very seldom, actually, it was only one time that, that we actually did have a, a full complement of 19 municipal members. And it's for a very short period of time. And there's a number of reasons for that. And, and most of you have already touched upon this, you know, the transfers in and out every every year potentially uh, but we also have other factors that play and uh, whether it is sickness but then we got maternity leave we got paternity leave again those uh time periods have changed from traditionally it was uh, 12 months or when we started there wasn't paternity leave now we're looking at 18 months when somebody goes on to that type of special leave again after a certain amount of time the building is there, but we don't fill that position. That's still an occupied position. So it's not like we're able to bring somebody else in to fill that. So when we start talking about the 19 uh, positions, but we're running at about 16 to, to 17 here, we reduce those one position, two positions. And then there still needs to be that little bit of leeway, that flexibility. Now you're looking from 17 to 15. We actually have 15 people here due to those transfers, due to the paternity leave, due to sickness, due to training, whatever the case may be. Um, so I, I think, yeah, it's just one of those things. And I think it's great though that we're having the conversation here because this should be a conversation that we have with our municipalities on, okay, uh, this is what we have for a lot of positions, but what is reasonable here to, to fill, knowing that there's always going to be certain gaps in place due to the transfers, due to leaves, of course. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Taylor, I have you, Councillor Rice. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, like our trouble is that our policing costs have gone up from a couple of years ago at 2.1 to 2.7 budgeted, and it looks like 2.9. So those are 28 and 30 plus percent increases. So it's something that we at least have to talk about and look at look at trying to get uh, something that's sustainable for us because we can't look at those costs uh, increasing that way into the future. For, um, anyways, uh, my question is, uh, I think I'm looking at an option that's not one of the options you've identified. Um, it's something that I've heard about though. What if we were to request an increase in hard vacancies, if you know what I mean? And, uh, what would that save us and how would that work? So, you know, I'm thinking that if we, 
if we if we want flexibility for the future for if uh place he needs say in four years increased without having to go someplace and get the position back we could just uh come to us and say please he needs an increased let's get one of those positions back something like that is how does how would that work and what sort of savings would we see it would we see the same kind of savings for example on fixed costs and on salary that we would see here is that a is that a reasonable kind of option but i'll let rita yeah. and i may go back and she sort of to your previous question, because it came to me, <laughs> um, in, in terms of the, the reduction of the three hundred thousand here that was presented in this table fourteen, uh, part of the the five year financial plan was developed with a forecast um, of seventeen for the current fiscal year, and that was projected to increase to eighteen next year. So a reduction of one FTE when you bring it from uh, from the eighteen, but bringing it down to sixteen, it's reflecting a reduction of two FTEs almost from what the five year plan was. So the five year plan wasn't. 17 across the board went from 17 to 18 and 18 out. So that's where, uh, to speak back to your question of the 150,000, that's closer to that 3.7 there that we spoke about. So then, so then just to address the, um, maybe I'll just touch on how the FTE. I just got confused on that, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Is that really two two positions then? That's Is that from what you're saying? Sure. Yeah. It's not really one. It, it's it's one, two, two FTEs. Okay. Yeah. So. How, how that FTE target is set is we we tend to we look at the history of what's been happening in the detachment and what have those special leads been looking like, you know. And so looking back a couple of years, like like was mentioned, you haven't been at the full complement of the 19 working FTEs. It's it's ranged from 16, 17, 18, somewhere around that mark. Um, I think ending the last fiscal year, we were just at about 16.82. So starting the year at 17 FTEs was a reasonable projection, um, depending on what position you're filling, you know, it's reasonable to expect that to increase to 18 potentially in the next fiscal year. And so that's how that plan was built. Um, that that target is something that can be set obviously through through your input to the conversations here and, and which then of course will will impact um will impact the budget reductions. In terms of leaving those positions vacant, yes, that is something you can do. Um, it's, it's been done in other communities. Uh, so essentially, you could freeze a position, two positions, whatever that looks like, and we would hold that as a hard vacancy. Um, freezing a position rather than eliminating the position creates some flexibility within the discussion as well to allow for staffing of uh, state transfers. If you have a member coming and someone else going, it allows for that flexibility to. Um, so utilize those boxes on the org chart per se, rather than um, result in an FTE level that's a lot lower, if that makes sense. Um, by holding a couple positions vacant, there is some of the other implications could be on your accommodation. Uh, so any your, your building cost sharing could be slightly impacted by, rather than eliminating the positions and the positions just being frozen, the ratios of uh, payments could be impacted there. That's probably not the biggest thing. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to touch on that a little bit further. Um, so, when you when you look at uh, this discussion, I mean, this discussion should be happening on an annual basis. Um, your point about the cost of policing is a real issue. Um, unfortunately, as a, as a service provider, we have zero zero chart ability to control those costs. Those costs are burdened onto us as far as providing that kind of a service. It's not something that we can turn around and say, oh, um, you know, this sex assault victim doesn't deserve to have their DNA analyzed here because we're, we don't think it's important enough. Well, that's not right. The, we do a sex assault, DNA should be examined at, at all times. Well, that comes at a cost, and that's the way the world is now. Everybody wants to charge uh, for something. And unfortunately, we bear the brunt of it. There's nothing we do in policing to gain money back. Right? There's nothing that we can charge out and say, oh, yeah, that's now going in, into our coffers and go somewhere else. Our cost of policing is a direct relation to the cost imposed on us to do that services, whether it be salary dollars that are put out because of their collective agreements that everybody has to, to now deal with, to the cost of investigations. Um, our cost of investigations are skyrocketing because of technology changes. We don't have a choice in that. We need to have certain things meeting standard now that we didn't have 15, 20 years ago. And that's something that we just now have to deal with. And unfortunately, and, I, and I, I'm a taxpayer, I don't like to see my taxes go up no matter what other, but that's that's how our service is funded is through taxes. 
through the communities, through the, 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 the uh, people we serve. And so as a result, it does get carried on to our communities. And like I said, it's, it's not what I want to see, but it's unfortunately the system that we live in. So when we look at our costs, we can share as much as we can of the, of the costs. These are the true cost of policing. We can show you that our investigational costs are continuing to, to skyrocket around technology. And if we could find a way, and I'd love to hear it, if there's a way we could tackle that differently, I'd like to know that because it's the last thing we want to do is tackle those additional costs on. But I can share with you story after story of where those costs impact investigations. Give me an example. I come from BC. I did a lot of work in BC for many years. In BC, we have this piece of equipment called a celebrate. Many of our detachment commanders have been able to burden the cost of that buying that equipment. It's a very high-tech piece of equipment that allows us to advance investigations dealing with certain uh, computerized equipment. In Alberta, this equipment isn't as widely available. It isn't as widely available. There's challenges around getting it through the court systems. So there's an investigative tool that's very expensive. We can't just advance in our investigations and do some of our investigations because there's challenges on the court. The court systems are looking at that. They're accepting that. We have a different judicial process here in some aspects. So there's an example of a tool. We're talking this tool is like roughly $20,000 US for this one tool, plus the training that goes with it. Those costs are not burdened by your community. They'd be burdened by the division as we move forward with this, some of this technology. But to advance that technology, we need the crowns to be on board with it, the judicial process to be on board with it. And then we need to be able to access that, train our members to be able to use that equipment. Just it's getting more and more expensive. But it's now needed in today's world to be able to advance those investigations. Everybody's got a phone. I heard you guys talking about it earlier, but shutting the ringers off. We all have phones, and there's evidence on those phones. We have computers. There's evidence on those tablets. We need to be able to advance those investigations. Technology is now part of that to advance it, and it comes at a high price. I mentioned DNA. There's another area that is just skyrocketing, the cost to do DNA analysis. So I'm just, I'm just trying to point, point out there that the cost of policing, as much as uh, we would like to try to reduce those costs, we don't. We want to investigate to the best standard possible to ensure that we're providing the best service to our communities. And that means we're looking at options to be able to provide that. What technology is out there? What is there we can do differently in regards to these investigations to ensure that we have the most uh, possible and best outcomes in our investigations? That, that's what drives us, is our investigations. And I just want to throw something out there that uh, no matter what decision council has in regards to the, the outcomes of, of the number of positions in the FTD tally, you always have to balance between what you have from a from a financial component to it and your service delivery. What is it you as a community are willing to accept for your community from a service delivery? Any reduction is going to impact service. Any reduction is going to impact service. But where does that where is that balancing act come out? I've worked in communities where there's a number of frozen positions, hard vacancies, and the community's hurting because of it. They can't do that proactive policing. Okay, the call about hey, I got so and so down the streets a drug dealer. Oh yeah, great. All we're doing is responding to reactive calls. We don't have the time to deal with that. And then I've been in other communities where there, there's lots of extra resources and they're able to do all this proactive work. It's that balancing act. And that's unfortunately where you as a community uh, have to decide what, what it is that you want from the funding versus the service delivery, where that balancing act comes in for you. Where are the service providers? We're going to try to provide the best service possible in whatever you end up with. I had a follow up to the hard vacancy question, just to clarify. Go ahead. So we can uh, call it freeze uh, two positions and save the same amount of money as we would if we permanently got rid of two positions, and that would still provide us with a little bit more flexibility. Is that the answer? Uh -huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's 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 about that working at <laughs> that working at figure that that is used and fed into the financial fund for the year. That that's that key figure. So whether it's you know, 20 boxes and you leave three vacant, right? Like it, it's that working at T that that's, that's the key figure that may, it will likely fluctuate throughout the year based on special needs and, and what happens there. If a member gets injured, you know, you're working at T, you might reduce that below the plan, 
because that would resolve my entry. But and getting that position back would be easier than if we permanently got rid of. So yeah. down the road, you wanted to increase your FTE complement back to say 18 or go to 19. You've already got the boxes there that you can now, as part of the financial plan, you can say, yes, we can afford 18. So please proceed with the 18 positions rather than 17. Thanks. And we do have, if I may, we do have some communities who who do say that to us, right? Is, you know, we want to keep our bird, FTE burn. So uh, that utilization at this level, and yes, it's not to the number of positions on, on the books, but we do want to keep it to that, <clears throat> which does kind of what you're talking about, allows for, uh, you know, the fluctuation if you do want to increase it's much easier but also it allows for those easier management if it ins and outs because you can't predict if somebody's going to go uh, off duty sick or get injured or or have you uh, what have you right so you can also manage kind of okay we know we're you know you're saying to us we don't we want to be billed to 17 at a max then we can you know sort of manage back and forth and see, oh, we're at about 17. You, you end the year at 17, but you might sit a little up and a little down and we're able to sort of navigate those ebbs and flows of, of HR if you do that option. Yeah. Yeah. If, I, if I may add, just to um, uh, maybe address or speak to some of the questions about corporal versus constable or whatever that rank is. I think I had touched on it too in, um, in terms of the classification, but the existing organizational structure will be based on that position. Um, the current position establishment, if you were into the positions that could have an impact on the organizational structure. Good, thanks. Okay, um, I'm next in, in queue, and, and I guess I appreciate the comments on the balance, and I think as I talk to uh, elected officials around the province, that's the question right now, is it's playgrounds or policing and how much policing and where are we safe or not safe so it's a this is a this is a really tough question so I appreciate you coming today because this for me personally this is the first time I, I've actually had this holistic discussion but um I have a follow-up question so that three hundred thousand dollar savings that we've talked about a couple of times now is from plan not from actual billing that's the difference is that correct correct okay thank you uh, Councilor Reyes. Thank you, sir. So if hypothetically, if we said we're, um, we have a full complement of 19, we want to stay or fill 17 positions and have two vacant or whatever you guys are calling them. Do we have to enter into our existing contract to do that? Because I don't think we are increasing or decreasing numbers. So to do this hypothetically, what would it take and how long would it take? It's from the communication perspective, I think it's that written confirmation of, you know, this is our affordable working FTE target, please operate with it or or freeze two positions or whatever that looks like and then from there. Yeah, technically you're, you're at that now. Right? You have 19 positions. Um our target for this fiscal year is 17. And we're trending at 16.8, I believe, right? Um, whereas I think previous years it was targeted was 18. So we're already at that now. And so we're going to take that and, and describe now. What do you see around the community from the police and their availability and so forth, right? And, and, your, and what your community uh, input is back to you. Um, reducing it any further, then that's where the impact's going to be. So we're, we're sitting there right now at almost at that exact 17 now. Can I just add one thing to this? Sever. Okay. Um, okay. So with 17, we have um, proactivity at 56% in around there, and that's great. Our um, case flow is at 700. That's super. So um, falling below that would not be good. 17. And vacancies happen yeah. very easily. Like we have a member headed up to high level. I believe it's high level. Um, and so the member that may be coming in, staffing may find a member that wants to come in. He's from Leduc and it takes eight months to sell a house. Well, that position is blocked for that member for eight months. So um, so those those that's how things change so fast. So 
if we wanted, if you guys decided that you wanted to keep that position vacant and the member going to high level leaves the position and it just wouldn't get filled. So can I say in six months that would be gone? I don't know when he would be going to high level. If I had to make an estimation, within four months, he would be going to high level. So that's how that's how fast, that's how, how easy, I guess, it would be. But we also have to remember that if we're operating at 17, where is, and, and I end up getting my next member who's going to high level, and he leaves, and that next member can't come in for eight months, well, now I'm down to 16. And then I get an injury, and now I'm down to 15. And then I have a pat leave, which is very realistic that three members during between transfer, pat leave, and injuries or or whatnot, now I'm down to 15. So now from 19, I'm down to 15, and I have to find four spots that I can take members from, which in turn, we end up with the burnout because I need overtime to fill those spots in order to maintain the schedule that the residents of Hinton are used to. Um, and burnout is very much a real thing in policing, and it's very hard to come back from burnout. Once you are burnt out, you don't want to re-engage in the community. You don't want to be part of that detachment. You want to move and start over. And then we lose all the training that we put into the member. We've lost, we've lost a family from our community. So there's a lot of uh, ripple effect, I guess. Um, so it's easy to say, okay, let's maintain it at 17. I don't know what next week's going to give me. I don't know what transfers are going to be coming in or going out. And I encourage senior members to move in, right? I, I, I like the balance between the recruits, but I may be told I get a recruit in four months. Uh, perhaps maybe something happened at depot and he gets back to for another three months. Well, now I don't have a recruit for seven months and he's got that position. So that's how it changes so fast. I have just a quick question on either simple versus prevention. So I, I noticed in this report, we have 19 municipal and three provincial. Other areas have 13 municipal and 18 provincial. Is that because of the land mass that they cover or where do those numbers come from? So I think the best way to answer that actually is for maybe Narmeen to talk a little bit about the workload analysis that you do and how, like, so, so we, on the provincial side, based on the factors that Fermino talked about, we allocate resources, the number of resources needed for that area, and it's based on the workload. So, Narmeen, if you want to just maybe touch on the factors that go into making that decision. Yeah, for sure. So, as I, as I talked about, um, the workload and the proactive availability are two of the indicators. But um, we also look at um, metrics, including um, criminal code files, the number of files per police officer, um, the crime severity index, the criminal code per thousand population, um, and the police to population ratio. And so Hinton Provincial Detachment um, taking all of those different metrics into consideration, um, that the provincial complement is assessed at requiring um, three police officers uh, as being sufficient to cover off, um, you know, all of the, the workload and the calls for service, um, ensuring that there's sufficient time available for proactive policing, um, as well as just in in recognition of uh, the number of criminal code files that are in that provincial detachment area, um, the population in that area, all of those factors kind of help us to determine that three positions is what's needed at the provincial detachment level. Um, and I th I think that um, Chris had, had alluded to the post detachment um, that Hinton does operate as a post. And so what some of the benefits of the post is that the provincial and municipal um, police officers work together and um, 
find some efficiencies in policing, supporting that um, shift schedule that allows for police officers to be scheduled um, around the clock. Um, and so that is something that because of the, the relatively lower numbers of criminal code files and the lesser population, um, the lower levels of crime rate, all of those sorts of things, um, the Hinton provincial members are able to um, work in partnership with the municipal members to just offer um, more cohesive, comprehensive policing services to all of the Hinton geographic area. It pretty sounds like a, a real um, plus to us. It's, it's good for you. That's what it sounds like. Because it is based on actually what's happening. Yes. Crime lives. Yes. Right. Can I ask a follow-up follow for clarification? If three are needed, uh, how come four are assigned? On page 16, it says comment of the three established positions four are currently working. There's one with two officers assigned to it. So if we only need three, why did we assign four? I can speak to that. Um, so from the district perspective, uh, we have challenges on the provincial side and a number of our detachments with resources. Like Charlotte mentioned earlier, staffing is a, a huge challenge for us. A lot of our detachments um, are struggling in trying to entice members to go there. And we have experienced a number of our detachments where they just don't have sufficient resources and to meet the bare minimum there. And so we need to look at where can we get those resources to help out those detachments. And so um, the, the fourth body here is a direct result of, of that need. I authorized a fourth, an additional person to be brought in on the provincial side to help us in other detachment areas nearby. So the Asper seen that benefit about having uh, those, some of those shifts built by Hinton. Grand Caps is another one by Hinton. So that provincial person, and we're taking that on and saying, okay, you're getting that benefit about having uh, that individual working and living in your community, but they're going out and helping out some of our other detachments. So that's where the fourth position is coming from. So that fourth position is not one of the 19 plus three. It's in addition to that. No, no it's, an, it's, an, it's an addition. It's an addition. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Ross. <clears throat> yeah, number of questions coming up, but uh, uh, I'm going to start with my original and then I'll get back in the queue if there is an OT. Um, we all, as we know, uh, over time, we know that in our own organization, right, is that, you know, work loads stay the same or increase. And as soon as we reduce, you know, we're going to see more OT. Um, currently, right now, uh, the detachment in Hinton, how are we with OT compared to, say, equivalent uh, organizations right now. Uh, you know, any, any thoughts on that particularly? You can probably answer I, that. I, 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 think that. I, no, we, I don't think we pulled those numbers directly. That's something we could look at, but um, it, predicting the overtime, it can be very unpredictable depending on the activity and the results. Right. I can kind of, uh, did you want to yeah, sorry. So just, just with my role right now, having eight mm -hmm. different detachments that I'm supporting, I do see a direct correlation with vacancies and the amount of overtime and, and oper operational readiness is what we call it. Those situations where members are on call, mm -hmm. uh, that increases. Uh, the more vacancies that we have, we see an increase, a correlation with increased overtime. So based on that, if I may, so... If we were to currently right now with having 17 members, granted those two members don't really get filled, but if we were to reduce it, you know, I mean, there's a chance that our overtime hours may drastically potentially, or no, I shouldn't say drastically, I don't want to use that word, but potentially could go yeah. up because, uh, I mean, you you you're still doing the work of that 17, and we reduce it. So I guess that's where I'm at thinking because OT is is a big expense, and that comes on us, uh, you know, as and it goes to that service level that you were talking about earlier. Point. So. If you don't mind, I, I you guarantee your overtime is going to go up. How much is going to have so many other variables, right. other variables to it? Um, how many vacancies you have? How many people are off for other you know, special leave, medical issues? Um, transfers, those are all going to have those impacts on the overtime. Um, right now, um, their situation is, is one picture. Six months from now, when you have that individual that's transferred to high level and you have uh, two more people on the path, maybe or whatever, now your overtime picture changes dramatically. So um, the less resources you have initially, 
the more you're going to be calling upon that over time as you go down the line. Okay, and so here you can guarantee there's going to be an increase. We just can't predict, you know, if it's going to be a two percent increase or a twenty percent increase, right? Because of the uh, the variables there. Yeah, I can say one more thing. I can, I can oh, mention also overtime is something that I. I monitor quite well um, because there is a direct correlation with burnout mm -hmm. with overtime, right? So we can offer overtime and it's money, but the, the repercussions of burnout, we can't, like you can't even put a dollar bill on that. Um, so I really monitor that and it goes back to having a, um, a very positive working environment that we are such a team in the detach room that members are more than happy to switch shifts and say, you know what, if they need more help on night shift, I'll switch my shift to night shift. We don't need the overtime because people are, it's just a team atmosphere. Everybody is there to, I guess, for the greater good. I guess it, I don't want to be cliche, but that's what it is. It's frontline policing and we're, that's what we're there for. So we don't see the overtime and I see all the claims that go through the detachment. So I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. I could just say one more was quick and then related to this. Uh, I guess not. I was just going to, never mind. Okay. Okay. Um, Mayor Michaels, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know how to say this. Uh, I do want to thank Staff Sergeant uh, Fragamenti. Fragamenti, yeah. Okay, good. Getting better. <laughs> it's a tough one. I know. Um, you, you spoke about the, let's say you, you're, you're down force people because of mat leaves or other reasons so i'm starting to have a concern that if you freeze two, you can't fill those two the let's say you're, if there's four people away so now you're 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 running at 13 people max i want to avoid that for sure i, I don't know where i stand I, I physically want to deal with stuff um is there any budgetary impacts like do we do <coughs> are what, what I'm getting to is, could we give direction hypothetically to just not pay for more than 17 temporarily? So it gives you the flexibility that if four people are down, you don't have to come back to us, but you can go up to paying 17 and give you that flexibility. Because I don't want to be in a position where you're down four, we freeze two, that's down six, and then you're starting to get these other things. So is there a, an alternative to give you the flexibility that we want to make sure that we're not paying more than 17, but then you could fill the other positions that are gone for other reasons without coming to us? Right. Is that I'll uh, let Rita answer the money part of things, but I, I feel as though we have such a great working relationship with town and council, as well as with uh, with Mac, I meet with him a couple times a week so that he's able to understand where we are. So if staffing levels were to take a change, um, it is something that's a timely thing that I can show to Mac and say, okay, this is what I've run into. I'm going to, so that when you guys see that change in your bill, it's not, wow, I, I wish we would have known about this. We, You guys already would know about it. So, I, um, so the answer is yes, I just want to, to say that we, our relationship has to remain open so that it can express the the timeliness of those changes that may come up because workplace injuries happen instantly and then I'm down member right there. I could just add that so in that specific uh, scenario that you ran where yeah we want to freeze the two and then we uh, unforeseen we have three or four that that go down it's not as easy as just picking up the phone though to fill those two like that that depends on recruiting staffing transactions where they're coming from so it's it's not something that would happen overnight can we do it yes but then i again i wouldn't be able to guarantee how long that position will run vacant because it all depends on whether we can get a brand new member for training or a transfer in from another community so can i uh, follow up on uh, staff sergeant's comments um the reason i asked that and, and i i appreciate there's a great relationship but I think there's an understanding of from council, and I'm, I may be wrong, that if you freeze two, you'd have to come back to us. And that's what I'm trying to avoid. Uh, so it's not a conversation with Mac. That's why I'm, I want to give you guys solutions where you can always be paying up to 17. And then if it's a freeze of two, you lose four. I think this council is under the, you'd have to come to us. And I don't, I'm trying to avoid that. 
So I apologize if I if I said it uh, not overly clear before, but uh, your 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 reply kind of uh, yeah, I'm struggling. No, with I that. guess that's that's good that we have that. Um, I guess that we have your confidence in that. Uh, I'll let Superintendent Ward kind of explain yeah. a little bit more. So as I mentioned earlier, on an annual basis, this discussion should be happening with with Shallow on what your what your desires are, what your what your needs are in the community. Are you are your policing needs meeting the needs of what you see in your community? So that discussion that uh, you're just talking about, uh, your worship, uh, saying, okay, well, you know what, based on everything that's going on here, we are comfortable with the target of 17 for this fiscal year. You say that, and that's laid out, and that's what we aim to hit all year long is 17, okay? If things are really good, you want to see more police out there, and you say, okay, we would like to see your target of 18 going forward for this next fiscal year. Okay, then that's what we'll hit the target on. You're not getting into those freezing and unfreezing, then we're able to manage to that level of what that target is. And so right now the target, um, however we came to it was 17. So we're trying to manage to that 17 mark, which is where we're sitting at 16.8. So it's just setting that target every year. And in a general discussion like this is all that really needs to happen. Is doesn't there need to be a full on motion or in that, in that regard. It just needs to be in a discussion where, where council wants to see the level of policing goes. If you're getting into freezing positions, that's that is more formal, and it does take a little more work. Like uh, Chris says, filling those positions takes a lot more effort from my part because it's all of a sudden now we got to start acting this. And right now, I can tell you, uh, with the uh, recruiting processes that around policing across North America, recruiting is very, very challenging. And so, if we say tomorrow we need to get a cadet in here, we might be in the in the holding pattern for a while. And so we, we need to make sure we have time to manage. And that's what you're offering your worship is, is exactly the best way to go forward from my perspective, because that gives us the ability to manage to a set target versus all of a sudden now we have to come up with, okay, now we've got to find four more people to come here. If I, I can just add from the financial perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so setting that working MT target is kind of, from my perspective, the number one thing as part of your forecast and planning your budget for the year. Knowing what that is, salary and those associated indirect costs are typically the largest component of the placing budget. And so setting that FTE target is, is going to be key in, in determining what that financial what that bill is at the end of the day. Um, we are really working to enhance um, the reporting and the things that we're doing to support you. and and knowing what's going on and helping to make those decisions. So um, we should have this somewhere in here, would have just received a, a period seven report. So we're now starting to do monthly reports rather than just a quarterly financial update. So now seeing a monthly report, you'll, you'll start to see, here's what your FTE is at, here's what it's at. You'll see that on that ongoing basis. So if you, you know, if, if you were ever to trend above the 17, we would see that right away. And conversely, if you're trending low, we would see that too which can then help you anticipate where you might end up at, at the end of the year and let that final go be. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm next in queue and I guess I'm confused again because uh, 19, two missing, 15, I think you said, if we reduce two, we're going to 13. So to be clear, um, we have 19 positions and we're actually operating with 17 positions. Is that correct? It's not 15. Like the two that are missing, if those positions were to be frozen, we would have 17 members, correct? Yes, we're missing a sergeant and we're missing a member in GI. Those positions are currently vacant. Okay, that's, that's helpful, thank you. And then I guess my question is, um, and it was alluded to earlier, and it's and it's really the challenge is that 30% increase over the last couple of years, 30 some. And that, I think, and this is a, is a question to administration, or maybe you could answer it, that's with 17 positions in place. Is that correct? Because I don't think we've employed 19. So those increases would have been with 17 positions. Is that correct? It, it would be with whatever you had working but that's yeah, i'm asking so my understanding is is it yeah, did we bill for 17 yeah. about 17, about 17. okay so yeah much and, and the forecast for next year was based on 18 FTE. so so some things like an equipment forecast though um 
until we know details of, for example, the pistol, obviously every frontline member would, would get a pistol, but some of the items, you know, maybe per, per detachment or maybe you need two per detachment on this size. So there's some variability in, in some of that and how that feeds into the cost. Yeah, but, it, but it's based on, sorry, what that, that FTE is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gasser Haas? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a question came popped up, I believe, during the AM uh, convention, and that was on um, what is a number for safer communities? Uh, there was a, dis a talk about that. I don't know if that's something you guys have at the top, because we were talking about, you know, what number for the town of Hinton is considered that would be a safer community. Did that yeah, I recall that uh, that was a discussion. I mean, um, mm -hmm. that's a real hard thing to really put a number uh, put a number to what considered to be safe. When you look at all the, the uh, aspects around um, the community, mm -hmm. when you look at our crime severity index or violent crime severity index, those are typically good indicators of the crime in the community. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the community is unsafe because they've got high crime. You have a major highway that goes through the community that has a lot of impact on your community from a crime rate. It doesn't mean the community is unsafe. So it's hard to say that the, the, the safe community is based on a certain number. You have to really look at what other aspects of the community are there to, to support that, that safe community perspective. Um, from, from my experience, I'm, I'm looking at uh, things like, okay, what's your capacity in your community to do proactive work, to, to be able to go out there and, and target those problem offenders in the community, those prolific offenders in the community. If you're dealing with a uh, a force that is uh, on the smaller side, their capacity is much smaller to be able to go do uh, proactive work. Whereas if you have uh, the more robust uh, organization, you may be doing a lot more proactive work. So it really comes down to your community, what you're what you're willing to accept from a safety perspective. Uh, but I, I'm sorry, but I, putting a number to it is really, really difficult to be able to say, you know, if you're at 75, you're a great community, you're safe. Well, does that mean 70 is not a good community? Right? So I mean, is it what value you use? It really is it's really difficult to put a value to. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up, please? Go ahead. You gave us uh, an option that had a seven member reduction. Uh you would recommend a reduction that was unsafe, would you? I don't know what actually near me. You might be able to speak to where that uh, number is coming from. <laughs> Yeah, so one of the questions that we received um, in preparing this report was to provide some guidance on what would be the the minimum policing, um, like the lowest number that we could go down to. And as as Blake talked about, um, there are a number of factors that, that go into this. Um, and we did say that based on just the metrics that I spoke to before, things like crime severity index, um, criminal code files in the community, uh, workload, proactive availability, all of those um, metrics, uh, we could not fall below seven. Um, we cannot fall, we cannot decrease by more than seven members without um, you know, very severely impacting um, the community. But again, at that seven member reduction, um, there would be service level considerations that would need to be taken into account. And all that this analysis looks at is just those metrics that I've mentioned. It doesn't look at things like community engagement or um, crime reduction activities that have been identified as a priority. It doesn't speak to um, really ensuring that prolific offenders um, are addressed appropriately in the community. Um, it really speaks to what we know the past five years worth of data around what your um, criminal code has been, what the 911 calls, um, those, those really, um, those key metrics, that's what we've looked at. And again, it's looking at five years of data um, in the past. Um, we did note that there was a, there was a murder in the community in 2021. Um, so those sorts of projections, we do not factor into 
determining what the appropriate level would be going into the future. We're really looking at what does the data to date indicate? And so that's where that reduction of seven is, is in response to a request from the community, um, from Mayor and Council to provide um, what is the, the maximum number of resources that could be reduced. Um, and really, um, Shiloh as the detachment commander and the district um, reps would be able to speak more um, appropriately around the service level reductions that would be um, experienced with that level of reduction. Um, and also around the vacancies, um, because this is this is a reduction of seven positions off the org chart. It doesn't factor in um, any of the vacancies that might be experienced due to you know maternity leaves or um, people being injured and off off um, frontline policing, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just looking at just those metrics. Thanks. Perfect segue, because I think Mr. Murphy's got some comments. Oh, wonderful. I've seen you actually address it right at the very end there. So we talked seven reduction of seven positions. Again, that's assuming that we have no other vacancies, no illnesses, nobody going off for, for any reason. And so as soon as you start running into that, uh, she's basically saying that's the bare minimum right there. And in reality, I to speak very frank here, I over 22 years, I had nine days in a certain location where we were fully staffed to the position numbers. That is it. So in the majority of detachments, we're quite often operating at a number that is not quite at that total amount. And it's that conversation uh, with, with Mayor Michaels there and just having those ongoing conversations uh, with the municipality and, and what your target is and what else, because we always are going to have that fluctuation at all times. I do worry when we start freezing positions or eliminating positions because then we also have that buffer that we, we can't forecast, which is again, the, the illnesses, uh, uh, injuries, pat leaves, mat leaves, uh, transfers. And I think I can safely say that there's no stomach here for seven. I think really it's what are the goalposts from here to here. Mm -hmm. so, so to help you make your decision on some of this stuff, I think we have to keep going back to what's the impact on the service. And I know we're talking a lot about the money side of it here, and that's very, very important to assess. But I think we have to talk about, you know, if you reduce one more low below 17, if you go down to 16, what impact is that going to do to your service delivery? If you go down 14, 15, if you drop seven, and I'm glad to hear that that's not really a desire, but, you know, a 24-hour model is not going to be able to be achieved with that many bodies because you're not going to have that, that capacity anymore, right? So what is a service delivery impacts for every change in your in your resourcing model. And that's something that, you know, every one of those has has an impact. And there's going to be a variance here. For example, um, one person taken off of the rotation, where's that person coming from? Is it coming out of the watch? Well, now you have one watch that's shorter than the rest. Is that something, is that the best case scenario? Um, or do you take someone out of the GI unit and take them and, and make the GI unit run with less people? So then what impact does that have on the GI? And every one of those comes with, with like I said, a service impact. And I don't think there's enough time for us to go through all those questions, those discussions with you, but there is that part of the discussion that really needs to be had as well. Okay, us. Yeah, and I appreciate that, Lee, because that's exactly why I'm, you know, it's, it's not always about the dollars, it's about that service level. And I guess my, so my question to you is, and I'm gonna preference this, because I know with fire and we did this, that there is a, a reasonable amount of time, they, they look at how, what's the expectation of a response time, uh, if I'm correct. Is that something that the RCMP also look at is when a call is how long do, does it take to get to, is there a reasonable expectation? Is that something you guys measure? Yes, and I mean, you probably get the specifics for it, sir, but uh, for priority one and priority two calls, there is a response time requirement that we look at, and it's, uh, we we do track it for both municipal and provincial. And uh, the exact numbers I don't have, Nermeen, do you happen to have those? I, I don't have those exact numbers um, for what our, what our service level standards are. Um, however, I do have... Um, in, in the package, there is information around the response times for um, Hinton Provincial and Hinton, Hinton Municipal. 
Um, so those are on pages uh, 13 and 16 of the report. So we do identify those. Um, as well as um, there's an explanation because there's two components, there's travel time and there's also response time. So travel time is essentially, um, I just wanna reference my, my report here. Travel time is essentially the length of time required um, for a police officer to attend a call for service once they've been dispatched. And then the response time also factors in additional components um, such as, you know, depending on the call, um, there may be uh, a longer time in the queue waiting for the 911 operator to answer the call, uh, the length of the call, um, so providing that information to the 911 operator, um, file maintenance, dispatching the file to a police officer, um, the police officer doing their duty of, you know, familiarizing with the file and conducting the initial checks and queries and then the travel to the to the location. So a number of different things go into those two um, items. Thank you. I guess the reason I'm asking that question is because it, it does boil down for me service. And if you were to ask anybody in our in, in our province right now about, you know, EMT services and are they adequate enough in the response time, I don't think anyone would say they are. Uh, and it's because of that system. It's been a lot of different changes, stuff like that. You know, the, the last thing that people want to do when they're calling the RCP is wait. Uh, and this is, I think, really educational, not only for us, but as the community as well, to, just to hear that too as well. Is, is how much time it takes from the time they call to the, it actually gets to the RCMP and then the travel time there. I think a lot of people don't realize that, uh, that it's not, there's a lot of lag time in between. Um, you know, so this is, for me, that's what I'm hearing is reducing means that prioritizing may start happening as well. I understand in other communities, they don't respond to all calls because they don't necessarily meet the criteria uh, and they don't have the, the people, the person power out there could respond to every call. My understanding is that Hinton does not work that way. Uh, they do respond to every call that's created a, a better relationship with our community members as well and, and a feeling of security as well and safety and security. So, uh, you know, I think that's what I'm hearing. And I guess the other about service level is what I'm hearing also is that crime prevention if we were to hypothetically reduce numbers and, you know, we have bike patrols, we have walk patrols, we have different ways of policing in our community that other communities don't have, would that be things that we would lose potentially if we were to say reduce numbers and then with other vacancies and things like that, would that we see be gone? Well, uh, as I said at the beginning, frontline policing would be a priority. So we would, uh, the service would change in regards to our community engagement. So it would okay. be the bike patrol. It, it would be our the parades. It would be that's that sort of thing where more focused on the priority because we would have less focus work. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Okay, um, and I have put myself back in queue because I can. Um, <laughs> And I guess on, on page 19 of the report, where option one is reducing a member from 17 to 16, I'm, I'm wrapping my head around the numbers. I mean, it's talking about that proactive uh, availability moving from 61 to 58%. So that, that police officer would spend 42% of their time responding to calls of 58% of their time doing proactive work. I mean... Is that 58% number a number? I mean, when I look at the comparatives through communities, that's a number, that's a great number. Is that is that a good number in policing? That's a great number. Um, yeah. I'm going to suggest that, uh, you know, again, I think our means talked about this is based upon the work chart um, as, as the numbers we have assigned positions. It does not take into account the vacancies that come from being members of ODS and so forth. And that's the part we can't predict, but 58% um, of proactive time is a good amount of time if all your positions are full. That's a good amount of time. That, that is a good number to work with. And I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Where the struggle comes is are all your positions full. 
and a lot of our communities, that's where on paper it looks like they should be uh, doing a certain amount of proactive policing, but because of a lot of vacancies, because of a lot of members that are off, because of occupational stress injuries, they're burnt out. They're not uh, being able to track the members there. So all they're getting is cadets that are going through the training programs. They're not able to provide that in real time because of that those gaps. Yeah, I think it's important to note in this report that is if every other position is filled with a working member, that, that's where we get those 57% uh, uh, or 15% uh, in that ideal world where you wouldn't have anybody else off. But I guess as a follow-up then, as, and I've heard it several times, that, that Hinton's sort of an appealing place to go to because of the workload. I mean, if you're presenting that kind of workload to, to, to members, it's got to still be a pretty attractive place to come to in filling positions. You know, I can speak from the district perspective. Uh, I deal with all the promotions throughout the district. And uh, Hinton is one place that is very appealing in all fronts and so from a selection perspective i'm getting to select from a good pool of individuals to come here that's not the case for a majority of our district it's a very a big challenge to get their positions filled in other places so uh, your model that's being uh, utilized in Houston right now it's very appealing to the members the community obviously is very appealing and i think a lot of communities are looking and saying what are they doing right can we do it I recently received a call from staffing in regards to the member that's going up to high level because we have a four-year commitment and every recruit that does come here or at, comes here as a subsequent detachment, it's a four-year commitment that you are, you are to stay. And there's um, experienced members waiting to get into Hinton. So that it, that speaks volumes about the, the place that we have here and the, the detachment and the morale because they get that information from the members who are working here. They call it night shift and say, how is it? Because if morale is not there, they don't want it. It's not, it's not worth it. If the burnout is there, they don't they don't want that, right? So they'll go to a different detachment where they can get the life work life balance. So it's extremely appealing to uh to experienced members. Thank you, uh, Mayor Michaels. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this was mentioned before, but I, a lot of stuff that we've talked about a lot. Um, 2023 is budgeted at how many? 17 or 18? 23, 24, sorry. Yeah, 23, sorry, 23 24 sure. is budgeted it, at... But it's forecast at 18 FTs. Okay. And current year is 22, 23 is forecast at 17. Okay, perfect. And, sorry, uh, what was the last thing you said? The, so the current fiscal year, right. uh, 20, 2022 to 2023 yeah. is forecast at 17, 17, and then 18 jumps to 18. It's jumps to 18. Okay, awesome. Thank you. May I? Please. You, when you say the current fiscal year, are you talking ours or yours? No. Uh, ours, so the fiscal year. So you've got the the three quarters. <laughs> Sorry, I know it's called the best thing. Yeah. Is that so April, like, though? Well, your April's fiscal year? Yes. Yeah. Yes. April when starts the new fiscal year. So can I follow up? So if, if there was direction, and I'm trying to flush all the options, but if there was the directions to change uh, that working number for 2023 to 2024 to be 17, we would essentially see that $300,000 saving. To, it, to 17? Because it's right at 18 right, right now. So right. to 17, yeah. it would bring down about half of this. So the 327 that's, that's identified in table 14 right. would be about half of that for one member. If you reduce to 16, we would see that. Right. Yeah. So I know it's a bit confusing. So it'd be 150 ish we, from from an, our municipal cost. We'd be it'd be about 150 if we gave direction to drop that uh, service level from our, our budgeting level of 18 to 17. Yeah. Ballpark 150. Ballpark. Yeah. I'm saying thank you. A follow up again, so I understand because it it wouldn't be a reduction. It'd be 150 thousand we wouldn't spend. So there would be no reduction off of what we've been spending, correct? Correct. No reduction to what has been spent currently. Yeah, but current. yeah, yeah. The, it's a forecast that's developed, and then we only bill you for what's actually materialized. Okay. So it would be a reduction in expected spending in the upcoming year. Yes. Councillor Oz? Yeah, I guess it's important I, I ask this question now, just in case later we have this conversation all around this hard vacancy, freezing vacancy, whatever. Uh, you said that there was some communities that do that. Um, I'm curious as to what is the criteria then 
that all of a sudden, right? Like it's one thing to say we're going to freeze it, but then who sets that criteria? How does that work? You know, because, you know, uh, my idea of what is criteria might be different than someone else's, but how does that work to then lift that so that we can fill that position? Yeah, so I think it's really through these types of conversations, again, it should be happening annually as we develop the multi financial plan, engaging with you to say, you know, really, uh, what do you want your target FTE to be? So 17, 18, whatever you want it to be, right? And I think when we say freezing, we're actually talking about an internal function so that we don't put somebody in a position um, accidentally. <laughs> we sort of freeze for us so that we don't accidentally have somebody in a position and then you get a bill that's bigger than than we agreed to around that. Mm -hmm. um, and then really that adjustment is a is a conversation uh, with your commander and then direction into us. It may take time to staff a position back up, right? For all the natural reasons. But really this is like like you're determining your service level. Um, whereas if you were to uh, eliminate positions, what happens is you write a letter um, saying, you know, to the government of Canada saying we're reducing, right, our position, and they come back and say, they actually come to us and say, you know, do you guys have concerns with this reduction of one position? We say yes, we say no, um, and then they come back and confirm that it leaves your work or chart. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to put that position back on, then you would have to write a letter back to the public safety minister asking for an additional position that takes some time. And then contractually, it'll, you know, there's sort of that piece in the agreement that it takes a year, it you know, may take up to a year of bill, right? So, yeah. yeah. So just sort of us knowing, you know, your target is 17 or your target is 18. And then internally, the sort of function is, you know, don't exceed this, right? You know, you watch your things ebb and flow, but are we still forecasting to land at the end of the year at your 17? Um, yeah, so that's, does that make yeah. it more clear? Could I ask yeah. you a, a follow-up for clarity? So if we set a working target, we could budget on that working target. I, There'd I, be I, enough certainty that we could budget on that working target. Yeah, and we would, I right? So there, we would, we're working towards this, Rita sort of spoke to, and I think, um, this conversation is probably long overdue. And we probably, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say probably, I know we haven't, it's sort of working down. We haven't been um, as strong at communicating as frequently with communities as we should be. So sharing information with you guys to help you understand what's happening. So for, um, with the forecast, so for example, um, we've been anticipating or forecasting the replacement for the pistols for a number of years now, and it has not materialized. So we need to be communicating that to you so that you know, okay, we're, we aren't expecting to spend here. You know, maybe, you know, at the end of the day, this is what we're expecting our bill to be. Maybe we do want to spend a little bit more support or what have you, right? So we're working towards enhancing that frequency as well as sort of breadth of communication with communities so well i think the new contracts got everybody on this side of the table way more focused on oh this. 100 <laughs> so. you know what and and i really will say that i appreciate because i i can imagine the difficult challenge that you have right um that you're facing in terms of our rising costs and i really appreciate the the questions coming our way because it allows us to give you this information and be responsive so that you can make the right decisions for your communities. CEO Panasic, did I see your finger go up? Do you have a question? Uh, uh, yes, I did. Jump no, into it, was the fray. it was partially answered, but just on the freezing of positions, just so I'm clear, um, essentially, if we said we wanted to freeze two positions, um, those would just remain as reserve positions and then we could say if somebody went off on paternity leave for 18 months, we could look at filling that. But I also heard that there was a uh, filling these positions is very difficult for the RCMP. So operationally, with these, we'll I'll call them reserve positions, would you be able to use those effectively to actually meet those targets or would we be looking at vacancies? in lots of cases, just operationally speaking. 
I'm going to suggest that maybe we use a term terminology about a funded position versus freezing, so that we talk about okay, what is the funding the number of positions you want to have for this fiscal year, right? And so, if 17 is that number, we will then manage throughout the year to be as close to that number at all times. So we know. So you know, Charlotte's able to look and say, okay, I got this number transferring up to high level. She's now already dealing with making sure she's got a backfill in the works to make sure that she's staying as close to possible at 17, okay? And so that management of it becomes a lot more um, possible to make sure we're around that level a lot closer. If we have to go and say, okay, now we're gonna try to get, and we've got the authority to go up one more position, we now have to go through that process to get that one more position, not necessarily authorized, but just built. So that process, we're behind the eight ball as far as the staffing of it. And that's where we, you know, managing it, where you know in, front, in advance is a lot more maintainable versus trying to say, okay, all of a sudden you got the green light to get one more. Okay, great. That's awesome. But we have a process to go through to get that position in. So there's going to be delay. So whatever that number is that for funded positions every year, let Shiloh know that at the start of the year. She's able to manage it throughout the year way more easier than all of a sudden, hey, Here's another position you can Thank you. And I, okay, go ahead. Sorry, can I ask uh, one follow up? Yeah. What, what's the average vacancy rate that we have? Is it continually around 10%? And as we, or if we did decide to reduce the, the staffing complement, does that increase the vacancy rates? So I can speak to the, what we're experiencing right now. Our vacancy rate um as at the whole provincial or SP level, not specific to uh like Hinton, um, is around three and a half to four percent. Um if you were to factor in our soft vacancies, we see that going going up a bit, but when you talk about our vacancies, it's around three and a half to four percent as an average right now. And I see a hand up on the screen. Yeah, and I apologize for interrupting the discussion, but I just wanted to alert folks that I do need to step off the call due to a, a, a pre-existing commitment that I was not able to change. Um, so if there are any additional workload or um, questions around um, the metrics that district or detachment are not able to answer, um, I'll connect with Shiloh tomorrow to see if there was there was anything that I needed to provide as a follow-up to today's meeting. Um, so great discussion i've really enjoyed um being part of it and i wish i could stay for the duration of it i i appreciate your input to this point so thanks very much for for joining us and uh, the hands aren't flying up quite so quickly so i think much of it's been covered anyhow so thank you thanks take care everyone thanks. mr chair if you want to follow up a bit more about the vacancy side of it so um you know there's been significant uh impact and, and you know COVID's impacted a number of uh, people in a number of organizations. Well, we uh, as well have seen that across the board. And uh, you know, when I look at across our district uh, with our vacancy patterns, uh, we have significant challenges in a number of our attachments for vacancies on the soft vacancy side. And that's a lot contributed to the workload that those members are going through and the burnout that's happening to those members in those communities. Um, and you know, I, it's, it's hard to be able to put a direct number to exactly you know four percent or five percent vacancy, but some of our attachments, I'm going to suggest, are closer to ten percent vacant on the soft vacancies um, because of the burnout factor, and and that you know the workloads that have been put on our members in those higher call volume areas, and so trying to find that balance is very challenging. Um, when I look at uh, uh, some of our um, challenges around trying to attract people to these places, like Charlotte mentioned, is when you're looking at the ability to go and do proactive work, that's attractive to me. We don't we we join this organization to be police officers because we want to put bad guys in, in jail. We want to we want to do that the right thing. Well if you don't have time to go and do some of this proactive work, that actually becomes a burnout part of it. We want to go and do that proactive, you know, we'll catch an impaired driver on a Friday night, go, you know, do that enforcement in that school zone. Take down that drug dealer. We want to go do those things. But if all we're doing is going call to call to call, we don't. And so that contributes to that burnout factor even more so. So 
finding that ability to be able to do that. I just want to point out that that our burnout rate will increase when you have the lower numbers, and you will see an increase in that, which then impact the vacancy part of it. Thank you, <laughs> uh, Councillor Oz. Yeah, I really appreciate this part of the conversation because I and what I'm hearing is hinted having the service level that we have is attractive that whereas compared to other communities that don't have that is not attracting so that's in our favor which i don't want to mess with personally um you know but another thing that i guess i want to bring up is is just a uh is, is the safety part of it too right is our members looking at too like you know i mean let's face it you do a dangerous job you're out there and you know and if the less members you have the more less likely you have other members to to, to uh, attend calls with you as well so that probably that factor uh is that part of you know what people are looking at as well uh which i think if i may is also what our community members are also looking for and a presence too because my understanding too is is that we see our members driving around a lot, uh, whereas other communities, you don't see them as much. So, I mean, and that presence alone makes it look like there's more members here than there actually might be, which is less attractive to those that we have to deal with, right? So, okay. So that's that's good to I appreciate that, that input because that's uh, very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I think that it's really important to recognize that our, you know, our members are families. Mm -hmm. that was like family. mm -hmm. um, they want to come to a community where it's safe for their family to live. And that's one of our struggles. One of our members don't want to take their family to some of these locations, right? And so it's you know we feel the impact as well for those high crime areas as far as getting people to go there. So it's benefit that the ladies like Pinkton for our members. So can I just one on that and then the question? Yeah. Well, do you see then more? places where they have separated families that versus Hinton, like they go off somewhere as a posting, but their family is living somewhere else. Do you see that more in other communities than you do so in, in Hinton? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank Mike, you. You've been very patient. No, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I apologize if it's been answered before, but we're running at about 16.8 from this year, from what I remember, the number was 16.8. Why uh, the targeted budgeted uh, at 18, the difference of 1.2? If we're rolling at 16.8 right now, why would we budget at 18? It's so the 18 is for our next our next fiscal. Um, so we, we developed that plan, right? And then that's I think heard a lot of comments around staffing and special needs and things like that. We we can't predict or know what's going to happen. So we developed that target, we developed the invoicing based on that, but then reality happens then transfers happen, special needs happen, all those things. And so that number gets adjusted. And so as we are coming up on, on your calendar year end or our quarter three, um we are looking at making those recommendations to the forecast to adjust more of that so then you're not being built more than that. And furthermore, I guess we do have a member on Pat Lee, so we do know exactly when he'd be coming back for the next year. Um, so that would be the increase on one member. Um, but like I said, I already know of two or three members that are we're gonna have to go through a bit of a change uh with members transferring out and transferring in. So so if I may, that was kind of my 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 rationale. If if they're if, if you're projecting that, shouldn't the target budget be a bit lower, knowing that you're not going to be at 18 anyways, right? Because if if there's right, because I think the conversation eventually is going to be you either want to freeze one, you want to get rid of them, or do you want to set your target to 16 or 17? I'll be honest. I think that's going to be the dialogue. So that's why I'm asking these questions of like, so why 18? Like, yes. Yeah, I still struggle with why. I think when the report was put out, oh. um, we knew for sure a member was coming back. Right. Um, I'm not sure if when the report was done, we knew of the other transfers that are in place, but we knew for sure that December 20th, we have another member back. So that will bump up our one member. Okay. So I guess more, uh, maybe more on concrete information that we right. had. Okay, that makes sense. If Thanks. That helps. Yeah. So as a follow up, so I can understand then 16.8 is operationally where we're at but the budget was 70 correct right. and so there was a there was a decision a concrete decision to move to increase by one position because this uh member was coming back is that yeah maybe well, it's just, i think it's also historically so it's not just looking at one specific year so when these reports these forecasts are being done it's looking at the previous five years what what have we typically been running at 
as far as the municipal positions go. And it, it does fluctuate, oh. it does vary. Thank you. And like with that, uh, they came up with 18 <clears throat> based on that. Thank you. Small follow-up, please. Uh, so maybe a silly question, but it might be part of our, our, our deliberation. Can you do half numbers? Could we set targets of 17 and a half, 16 and a half, or uh, uh, not to be... Mike. You'd have to bring in a really short off. <laughs> because of all the, the ebbs and flows, it's never going to be 17 or 18 or right. I get it why it's 16.8. So could we set targets of 17 and a half? Yeah. So, I think that at uh, the end of the day, that's when the building might work out to be right that way. But from a management perspective, I think that uh, you'll end up having some other gaps there because we can't staff a half position, right? So we need a full position to staff it. So if, for example, we know this person is transferring up to high level, we know we have a position to fill, we will initiate that process to fill it. But if we're getting closer towards the end of the year and we only have half a position to fill, if we fill it with a full position, we're going to be going over. And so that's where we have to look at that from a management perspective. Can we actually manage? half a position for our organization and right now i don't think we can actually manage unless we start getting you know a whole new thing with budget agreement and part-time employees so okay. so i think that if i may just i think the distinction is between people and bodies yeah. and billing exactly. <laughs> right because of and that's and that's i think when we're talking about um 18 Yes, we're talking about people, but really we're talking about a bill of eight or uh, your bill likely will come in at around 16.8, but there could have been 18 people, right? And then some of them are in and some are out and some are in. So, so from a billing perspective, if that's where the conversation, you know, if really that's where the decisions made, there's absolutely no... Um, there's no problem in sort of setting a half target like that because we are talking about billing yeah. and then we would just manage from a billing perspective to say, okay, you have this many in, this many out, you know, we're getting close to that 17.5 utilization, you know, we need to sort of hold the line or we need to, right? That doesn't necessarily mean the people. So. Thank you for that. Yeah. Hold up. Hold up. yeah. And we, we we would do that by talking about like Blake said funded positions. Yeah. So yes, we, absolutely. We talk about a funded position. You might yeah. have a little bit more. You might have a little bit less on average. Yeah. It works out to this much funding in this many. And that would positions. be that target. That's right. The way we would describe it. Okay. Yeah. And I think the times that it would be maybe over is when I had a member transferring in and a member is still here to leave. Right. So that's something that's also it is manageable. Um, but sometimes not always avoidable. So if I want that to be simultaneously, then then there may be that overage, but then there may be times when the member is left and there's six months goes by and I can't, the person doesn't sold their house. And we've seen it uh, a couple of years go by, right? So it is, it's very dependent on many other. Uh, Grand cash, for instance. Sure. Yeah. And that billing will go up and down, up and down every month, depending on, you know what's happened right with the people coming in people going out somebody was off sick that kind of thing that will go up and down at the end of the, <laughs> at the end of the day your bill will be based on the full year we sort of project for the first three months right for the first three quarters we project and then we reckon them correct yeah we'll come here three is when we start to make some of those uh recommendations of either I, I anticipate a reduction just based on the FT. Yeah, yeah, maybe some of the training or equipment or something's not much in the line, right? So I expect a reduction in, in that invoice, maybe three potentially. And then, yeah, figure out the rest of the year based on what happens, right? It just gets tighter and tighter as year closes. So that's our Q3, but for you, for Q3, that would yeah. be. So then that, if there's adjustments that can feed it to support it closing out your budget, what that looks like. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Thank you, sir. So I just need a yes or no on this. We have 19 established positions. We've got 17 filled. Two are vacancies. Could those two vacancies be the funding positions? So if one of the 17 leaves, 
you can draw from one of the things mm -hmm. I'm not sure I completely understand your question. Well, with, okay, we've got 17 working and two are off. Um, and we want to keep 17 positions and have two vacant. I don't know if they're called hard vacants or I don't know what those two are called anymore. So I just don't want to lose our full understanding of 19. So I guess the part about, so if I had 17 and one, I'm going to lose one of my members. <laughs> they block that position. I can't put somebody else in that position. Um, but if I want to fund, uh, say, okay, I want an extra member and I put it into one of the soft vacancies or the, the frozen position, I then the member comes back and I have this member and now I'm double bunking. And so therefore you will see 18.5. That's where you'll see that increase because it can't, um, I, I, that member will come back and this member's here and they're stationed here. So I, I can't just, I guess, borrow a member from somewhere to fill that. Okay. My concern is I just never want to lose that 19. <laughs> I don't want to lose the 19. We don't need that full complement. But to have that ability to sell it, as you never know, you know, five years from now, boy, we might be needing all 19 plus five. So. She said all that. Okay, thank you. Um, so you have a member departing to high level. Has that uh, process started? Correct. You would look to have you have you undertaken the efforts then to fill that position? I have been in discussion with staffing, and um, I guess to kind of make it a simple process, the mem they initiate the start uh, the transfer to high level, then they search a system, and members put in their desirable uh, detachments. They search that and find out who's the best suited for that. So that would be staffing's portion. Okay. But they have started the. The process to fill that member's position yes thank you all right council anything else thank you very much for coming i think there's going to be a bunch of discussion now we can get to the debate part of things but um we really appreciate the time you've taken because now we can talk data mm -hmm. and that's really what's been missing to this point um <laughs> And 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 um, I'm really surprised that this hasn't been given the size of of, of the, the component of policing as a proportion of a municipal budget. The fact that this hasn't been more of a discussion on an ongoing basis uh, is is a bit surprising to me. Not not even just in the last few years, but always. So I really appreciate the time uh, and actually giving us um, uh, command and. Uh, finance and the statisticians so we could actually understand what's going on. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. And please don't hesitate. Any more questions, if we can do anything more to facilitate, you know, your decision making, please don't hesitate to reach out. We won't. Absolutely. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Make sure you spend lots of money in Hampton and right. buy all your Christmas gifts. <laughs> <laughs> And for the rest of the people in the room, let's take a seven minute break. If any of your